السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام برادر ہاؤ آر یو ڈوئنگ وعلیکم السلام ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ وی ار جسٹ فائن ویری گڈ سو آئی تھنک ٹائم اٹس اٹس ٹائم ٹو اسٹارٹ آور ویبینار اینڈ آور گیسٹ اسپیکرس پروفیسر اسد زمان پروفیسر محمد کبیر اینڈ اسحاق بٹی دے ہیو جینٹ آور میٹنگ سو آور سمپوزیم از ریلیٹڈ ٹو اٹس ویری ٹائملی اینڈ امپارٹنٹ سمپوزیم وچ از ریلیٹڈ ٹو ریولیشن آف اسلامک اکنامکس اینڈ فائنانس اینڈ ٹوینٹی فسٹ سینچری سو the main focus of this uh, webinar will be will be talking about the progress of uh, will be of islamic economics and finance in last seven decades and it will be uh, uh, be discussing the deficiencies of islamic finance and economics towards transmitting the knowledge into social sciences understanding the recreating ibn khaldun uh, khaldun's approach to social sciences uh discussing the importance of islamic economics and finance in muslim minority countries and uh, uh, uh countries and less of european uh, lessons for Euro- european country so uh i will start from the uh introduction of our keynote speaker our first keynote speaker is professor asad zaman and uh, i will go through his briefly uh, uh, briefly discuss his profile uh, professor asad zaman is ex vice chancellor pakistan institute of development economics and member of prime minister economic advisory committee he is he is a great scholar of economics and currently serving as a director of social sciences at al nafi online educational platform and managing editor of international econometric review he graduated from mit in 1974 and earned his master and phd from stanford university in 1976 and 1978 respectively he has vast experience of top national and international universities including columbia university uh pencil pencilonia university belkent university lahore university of management sciences international islamic university uh, and pakistan institute of development economics uh he has been member of economic advisory committee of prime minister uh, uh pakistan and monetary policy committee of state bank of pakistan he has served as a director general of international Institute of Islamic Economics uh his work is published in various high ranked journals like annals of statistics journal of econometrics econometric theory journal of labor Econ- economics and many others he is author of textbooks of econo- econometrics titled statistics uh, foundations for uh, econometric techniques that is widely used as a reference in graduate courses in many of the top universities he has supervised over 50 phd and master students in addition to this he has made a remarkable contribution to academia in the field of economics econometrics and islamic islamic economics uh, and through his uh, unique ideas novel approach and dedicated effort this is the brief introduction of our uh, first speaker professor asad zaman now i would like to professor asad zaman uh, to, uh, uh, to to share his views about uh, this uh, symposium bismillah rahman rahim thank you for this introduction can you hear my voice clearly yes it's clear right, uh, i'm going to screen. share my screen and uh, my presentation
Okay, so I think. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. So, what I am going to do in, in the past, uh, I have written a couple of papers showing that basically social science is a study of society. So, there is no abstract society. There is African society, there is Malaysian society, there is American society, there is European society, and so on. So, when you say social science, you have to study some particular society. There is no, no science which is applicable to all societies of the world at the same time. So I have shown that what we call social science is actually Eurocentric social science or Western social science. It's derived entirely from lessons that were uh, learned by the Europeans over the course of their historical experiences. And so the whole structure of social sciences reflects the European experience and uh, excludes uh, Islamic experience completely, as well as all other non-European societies. So there is no way to fix this problem because this uh, social science is built on uh, foundations of European experience and it cannot be uh, adapted because the European experience is very unique and very different from that of our societies, uh, all other societies in fact. Because Europeans were the only ones who conquered the world and nobody else did that. And there are some reasons for that. It also has to do with the social science. So anyway, I have in my past papers, I have explained why uh, their social science is, is not usable. But that leaves open the question, then what should we do? And so this paper is uh, addressed to the question that actually, if you look at the history of ideas, Ibn Khaldun, can rightfully be considered the founder and father of social sciences. Uh, he says in his book that uh, the um, methodology I am creating is completely new. Nobody has done it before. And basically what he does is he analyzes the process of social change through the centuries and, and on a long-term basis. And so he is the father of sociology, political science, economics, all of these things are discussed in detail in his work. And um, uh, so basically, if we abandon Western social science and go back to the original approach created by Ibn Khaldun, then we can get a, a, a good uh, foundation for uh, social science. So. Since social science, the word itself is compromised, so I would like to use Ulumul Umran for this. Now, in Urdu, we call this Imran, but in Arabic, the word seems to be Umran, to the best of my knowledge. So, uh, in this lecture, I will explain what Ulumul Umran is and how it should be updated to keep up with the times. All right, so very briefly, we will go through world history. Uh, Islam advent 14, 40 years ago was, uh, took the ignorant and backwards uh, Bedouin to world leadership. And uh, it created a world civilization which was based on rahmatullil alameen, compassion for all nations and on the brotherhood of mankind. We are all... Uh, brothers and sisters, descendants of Adam alayhi salam and Hawa. So, uh, even though this point has been suppressed in the world history, the fact is that the dark ages of Europe were ended by the light of Islam. It was the reconquest of uh, Qurtuba and uh, the um, libraries of Spain uh, by the West, which gave them access to the knowledge that was required to end their dark ages. 
these new ideas flooded into Europe in the 13th and 14th century and caused a revolution, including changes in their religion and lots of bloody warfare between Christian factions. And uh, eventually, because uh, Christianity was split up and they were fighting each other, so the European intellectuals had to reject religion as a basis of politics because they saw that religious politics leads to terrible outcomes. People are continuously warring each other. So they created a secular theory of state and politics. And eventually they rejected Christianity and morality. And they said that when you're doing politics, it's all about power and everything is fair in love and war. That is, you can do anything for the sake of power, profits and pleasure. This unique morality very different from both Islam, in which jihad is actually a, a, a religious responsibility. So it is done according to very strict rules. There are very strict morals for the conduct of warfare in Islam. But in the West, they had no, uh, they had no morals. And so this was one part of why they were able to conquer the world. So, the global conquest and colonization which took place because the Europeans were continuously fighting among each other and this led to a military revolution while the rest of the world was at peace. And uh, so they acquired an advantage in both um, weapons and military tactics as well as in ruthlessness and violence because they had developed these racist philosophies that said that um, we are the only human beings. The white man is the human and every other race, whether it's brown or black or uh, yellow, they are not fully human. Immanuel Kant, who is one of the leading philosophers of the Enlightenment, he discusses in his book how you can beat the Africans and how the, you can uh, the master can kill his slave and he is called the, the leading moral philosopher of the past three centuries in Europe. So you can imagine what the level of morality is. So many um, philosophies were developed in Europe which were very inhuman and actually these philosophies continue to gu guide world politics today. today uh, the U.S. can invade uh, Iraq and kill one million civilians and destroy the whole country and nobody says anything about how this is bad or wrong. But if one, uh, uh, one crazy individual kills, shoots 10 people and he happens to be a Muslim by birth, then um, the whole world uh, gets outraged. So you can see how the European, um, the Eurocentric outlook is very biased towards some kinds of events and against some kinds of events. In Britain, we present the colonial project as being about teaching the natives table manners and double entry bookkeeping. In India, the British manufactured a famine in the 1870s. Out of nothing, there were food services. Massive amounts of food, but the governor, Lord Lytton, insisted that this food be exported wholesale to Britain. The ensuing starvation killed at least 12 million people, possibly as much as 29 million people. All relief works were banned except for hard labour in labour camps, where the inmates received the same ration as the inmates at Buchenwald, and where there was a 94% death rate per year. This was all done in the name of liberal free market capitalism. Of course, the British did something similar in Ireland. In Kenya, soon after the Second World War, there was an uprising by the Kikuyu people who wanted their land back. The Kikuyu were herded into concentration camps supported by the British, almost the entire population of over a million people. People were systematically tortured to death. They invented a new kind of pliers whose purpose was first to crush raised testicles and then to cut them off. They raped women with bayonets, 
they raped men. Similarly, a favourite technique was to ram sand up the rectum of the stick, sometimes to roll up the barbed wire and kicked around the compound until they bled to death. Some of the British soldiers boasted that this is a living memory. The colonial secretary lied about it. The papers documenting it were burnt. The impact of the rich, powerful nation has been so phenomenally murderous and destructive that it has been completely airbrushed from our national consciousness. In order to justify the land-grabbing colonial projects, Okay, I think uh, we got an idea of... So, basically, a very, very brutal and ruthless colonization whose details we do not know because they have been suppressed from history. We have to dig them out as to what really happened, what was, which was so horrible that it is, it is just impossible to write about, talk about. So, we were colonized, but... What we don't understand is that the colonization is a process of conquest of knowledge. It, the colonization occurs in the heads and the minds and the hearts of the people. The shock and awe tactic that is used is that um, we come to believe that European society is the highest ideal. All other societies are deficient. And this is what Eurocentric point of view is. So that's why... Uh, social science is only the study of European societies because those are the best societies. Every other society which doesn't match European society is defective and so it has to be fixed. So you have to export your democracy to, to, uh, to Iraq and to all other countries. Any, uh, only Europe is, has democracies and everybody else is undemocratic and this is a failing automatically to develop means to become like Europe. So this is what conventional social science is, and that is why it is unacceptable. That's why we have to develop our own. <clears throat> so, you mentioned the I have to um, restart this because um, it uh, so basically a very very All right, so, so we can, I'm not going to talk about uh, all of social science, although all of social science is in need of being rebuilt. I'm going to talk about economics. And um, the Eurocentric economics that we all study says that the goals of both individuals and societies and firms is the pursuit of power, profits, and pleasure. Nations pursue power, corporations pursue profits, and individuals pursue pleasure. And the social system, which is how should we interact with each other? How should nations treat each other? How should individuals treat each other? Well, this is the jungle of ruthless competition for the survival of the fittest. And that leads to efficiency. So if somebody has the power to kill another person, then this is good, and this is moral, and this is efficient behavior. So the values underlying this kind of economic theory in which one nation is uh, authorized and entitled uh, to uh, destroy and invade the other one, if it has the power to do so, if it will maximize its power and profits, this is perfectly permissible and required and desirable because it leads to efficiency. And these assumptions are taken to be universal, objective, and scientific. And all of social science is built on these toxic assumptions. And the effects of this 
is visible in that under European domination, the world has been in more or less continuous state of warfare, which has disastrous outcomes for humanity and the planet. Today, even though the wealth we have is 100 times that uh, that was available a century ago, but 1 billion people are below living below poverty lines. And uh, this is incompatible with Islam. Islamic society is built on the opposite values of generosity, cooperation, social responsibility, and brotherhood. So Western social science as we know it today was created in the early 20th century. Very few people know this, actually. People think that social science goes back to Adam Smith, etc. But actually, this is not true. Uh, Adam Smith and uh, many others uh, developed the original form of social science, which was not uh, the form it takes today. The form uh, that social science takes today was developed in early 20th century, and it was based on imitation of physics. The idea, that's what the science means. So basically, human beings as they are, are not subject to laws. So economics replaces human beings by robots, which are subject to mathematical laws. And then it studies the society as a physical system, which is subject to optimization and equilibrium, just like Newtonian physics studied astronomy. Uh, so the society is a system subject to mathematical laws. This is completely absurd and ridiculous because societies are not subject to laws. So we plan to replace this by Ulum al umran study of human societies and civilization. Civilization is what we would like to call this. But if you say civilization studies, or if you say social studies, or if you say, actually, Umran refers to urban, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, transition, critical transition that um, Ibn Khaldun is trying to capture is when people used to live as nomads, and then they collect into cities, and that's the start of civilized living. Uh, so uh, this requires, uh, so in, in, instead of using Western words which uh, refer to existing fields of study, I would like to use the word Ilum al Imran to say that we are abandoning Western social science and go back to the original Ibn Khaldun. So we ask for a start from fresh foundations, but what are these foundations? So this is what I would like to discuss. So Ibn Khaldun writes that, uh, and this is the translation, that the condition of the world and nations and customs does not persist in the same form. There are differences according to days and periods and changes from one condition to other. And this is the case with the individuals, times, cities, regions, districts, periods, and dynasties. So basically, the critical, the central question of Ibn Khaldun, and this is the basis of Ulum al Umran, is how do societies change over time? So it is the study of change. So immediately, it goes against the principle of economics, which is the study of equilibrium. The equilibrium is a process, is a place where society is not changing. So we, we don't study that at all. We study how societies change. So there is no equilibrium, and again, there is no optimization. So these are the two key tools of economics. So basically, we throw out all of economics by rejecting equilibrium and optimization. So all of modern economics is just in the garbage can. So the how do we? This is actually what um, um, Ibn Khaldun studied: the principles, the laws according to of motion, according to which societies change over time, and that is going to be our main uh, goal in Ulum al Imran. So how we change societies? So I have given this uh, talk on a three-dimensional perspective. In this three-dimensional perspective, we, we have three dimensions. One is the normative. What is an ideal society? This is what Islam teaches us. What is the best possible society? What is the best possible behavior? The Prophet Muhammad wasalam, was sent for us as the ideal example. And the Khilafat Rashida is the example of an ideal society constructed according to the ideal laws. So that is the uh, one dimension. 
A second dimension is descriptive. Okay, so we've got an ideal. Now we look realistically at where we stand currently. We are very far from this ideal. So we should be able to describe that people are selfish and, and uh, lots of bad things are going on. So this is the descriptive part. And then the third part is transformative. How do we create change? So I have a current situation which is very far from the ideal. I have an ideal. Now what is the method by which I can change this uh, current position which is far from ideal towards the ideal? So one very important thing to understand because Western science is against this is that we are not outcome oriented. We do not judge the effort to change by asking did we uh, arrive at the ideal? Because we know that the ideal will never get there because the ideal, the perfect behavior of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is far beyond our reach. So our judgment is not about arriving at the outcome, but it is about the process. Are we making the struggle for the good? Are we, we are always engaged in a battle against good and evil. So the question is which side we are on, not whether we win or lose. And this is well uh, this is well um, understood in Islamic philosophy that uh, whether if you win, you are Ghazi and if you die, you are Shaheed. In both cases, you are successful. So the only thing which matters is to be participating in the process for uh, change towards the good, not uh, uh, the achieving of the goal. So what are the fundamental elements of social change? Well, the key is the training and education which this generation gives to the next one. If everybody receives the same education, and this is what happened in traditional society, if somebody is a, is a weaver, he, his child will become a weaver. If somebody is a, is, a, is a trader, he will teach his skills to his children. So the traditional society stays the same over time. That's sort of equilibrium. But if uh, new things are coming up, if the profession that our child is taking is a software engineer and uh, in our time there was no such concept, uh, computers had not been invented, then we know that social uh, society is changing because the children are receiving training and education which is very different from that of the parents. So if we want to learn the future of the society, we, we have to understand the educational mindset of the children. And that is why the current initiatives by Imran Khan to uh, bring a single curriculum is very important because it will create unity, which is desperately needed. And if we can use the educational process to create a strong cultural identity, which is part of the objectives, this will be a very essential step towards independence because our current Western education uh, teaches us uh, an inferiority complex towards the West. So one of the key insights of Ibn Khaldun is that social classes are the agents of change. If you want to study how societies change, uh, you cannot study individuals. One person cannot do anything. You have to look at groups. And what are groups? Well, at the time of Ibn Khaldun, it was, uh, there was no social media. So basically the groups were tribes and clans and, uh, and re relatives. So th these were the groups that Ibn Khaldun analyzed. But today, if you want to follow his ideas, then you have to look at the theory of identity. What creates identity? How do I identify with Muslims? Now, today we have multiple identities. I can identify as part of the Islamic Ummah. I can identify as a member of human beings. Uh, all brothers and sisters, I can identify as a Pakistani, I can identify as a Sindhi or as a Baloch. So there are multiple identities and each of these identities creates, so we have to look at the strong identities which create class consciousness and solidarity because a group has to be able to act together in order to affect history. So today we have national language, region, culture, religion, allegiance to common ideals, these are possible identities and these are possible basis for class consciousness and solidarity. And these are the units that we need to analyze in order to study the process of social change. So 
how is identity created well uh, this is very closely linked to the first point that identity is created by education our teachers tell us that you are a pakistani and you should believe in pakistan or they tell us that you are a member of the ummah of muslims and this is our history so we trace our history to the uh, prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the history of muslim or they can teach us other things and in fact today other things are being taught today we are being taught our education teaches us that uh, that the developed world is europe and we are underdeveloped and development means becoming like the west and so the uh, education teaches us that how we can become human resources how we can learn how to make maximize money and it teaches us that the goal of life is to make money and um, all of the education is addressed to the mind uh, it is meant to create human resources it's not addressed to the heart how we can learn to be um human beings aadmi ko bhi muyassar nahi insaan hona this share cannot be understood by a modern student because they cannot differentiate between human being and human resource all human beings are just resources <coughs> so learning to be a human being this is uh, something which requires input of heart and soul this is not part of a modern education modern education is purely about the brains and this is part of uh, western intellectual tradition so when social change occurs uh, sometimes from external reasons sometimes for internal reasons for many other reasons from technology there can be many reasons for change but when change occurs then it has differential impact on classes different social classes may be created may be destroyed some may be advantaged some may be harmed if we look at united kingdom england they uh, the traditional society had landlords and peasants farmers and artisans but the industrial revolution created commercial classes industrialists and merchants these were non existent prior to the industrial revolution but these became the more most powerful landlords became transformed into agri businesses peasants became laborers and artisans became the commercial classes so these changes if you study then you will understand how economic growth occurred in england you cannot understand it without understanding the classes and the differential impact of the changes on the different classes so how do different classes respond to social change well first of all a class has to have a identity it has to have solidarity in order to be able to respond but then when when a class notices that a change is happening then they have to develop theories about how this change will occur and um, how we can manage it for our best advantage so a theory comes in very critically into the response of different classes to change uh, because this is a very abstract concept it would be useful to give an example so before great depression classical economic theory says that labor market is put into equilibrium by supply and demand and so the policy to get full employment is to allow the free market to operate now after the great depression uh, unemployment shot to about 20% and stayed there for uh, 10 years or more so it became clear that the free market is not working so multiple theories emerged as to what should be done so one of the theories was communism that uh, capitalism always creates this kind of problem and the only way to solve it is to for the laborers to unite and overthrow capitalistic system and this theory became very popular but keynes developed a new idea he said that free market does not lead to equilibrium in the labor market and full employment will not occur so the government has to help create full employment so it is widely understood that keynes actually saved capitalism because if the, the third option which was still there hayek and some other free marketers were saying it that just do nothing and um, eventually equilibrium will come back so if the many politicians realized that if we do nothing there will be a revolution because there was conditions are so bad 
that people will not be able to, uh, the people have nothing to lose, so they will revolt. So when Cain said that the government should go and help people get jobs, governments did a massive welfare programs and that basically saved capitalism. So the point is that the different theory is different, uh, lead to different policies. The classical economic theory says do nothing. Marxist theory says that uh, you have to have a revolution. And Keynesian theory says that cap capitalism works well, but it doesn't work well in the labor market. So the government must do fiscal policy, spend on infrastructure projects, which will create employment. Now, all of these theories were rejected uh, in the Reagan-Thatcher revolution. And basically, the theory which became popular and which was used to handle the global fi financial crisis was monetarism, that recessions happen due to a shortage of money. So basically, central banks pump trillions of dollars into the economy to try to prevent the global uh, recession, but that didn't work. <coughs> so, uh, one of the points is that changes um, are done according to theories. Different theories lead to different policies. And different policies have different impacts on the social classes. So here is an illustration of what happened according to different policies. So before the 1920s, before the Great Depression, the, uh, the Classical theory led to concentration of wealth at the top. So if you look at this, uh, the Roaring Twenties, you have a very high peak. The, the top 1% uh, has about 25% of the total wealth uh, just before the Great Depression. But after the Great Depression, the Keynesian era came into being and the laborers were helped and you see a decline in inequality. The top 1% goes down from 25% to about 10% in the 1970s. But in the 1970s, you have the Reagan-Thatcher, uh, late 70s. You have the Reagan-Thatcher revolution, and Keynesian economic was thrown out, and a new Chicago-style economics, free market economics came in. And from there, you see that the top 1% starts rising again. So different classes uh, have different theories, which have different policies, and uh, different policies affect the different uh, classes in different ways. So this is one of the key <coughs> uh, points to understand in terms of the Ulum al-Umran. Now, one very important uh, issue that comes out of this analysis is that uh, different classes, especially the, the powerful, are usually a small class. So nobody can force their um, policy on others by brute force. So what they need to do is they need to make the policy attractive to the others. So this means that deceptive theories are, are required. So, for example, there is a bestseller by Milton Friedman and Rose called uh, and Rose Friedman. Uh, the title of the book is Free to Choose. And it says that the best society is one in which everyone has free choice. And actually what happens in such a society is that the powerful get to do whatever they want and the poor have only one choice. They can sell their labor to the rich to get enough money to eat food and uh, to support their families. But uh, this is the reality. But the, if you look at the book, it makes it very appealing and attractive. And even today, the US public uh, votes against its own interests. They, they don't want uh, a socialized medicine, even though the cost, medical costs in uh, US are highest in the world. And also, the, a very huge percentage of the population is uninsured. They don't have enough money for one medical emergency. So the point is that the system teaches people to believe in ways which are against their own interest. What Karl Marx said is that laborers are exploited, but this exploitation does not happen by force. 
but because the laborers believe that they must be, they, they need to be exploited in order for the system to work. Similarly, today, colonialism created an education system which leads us to believe in our own inferiority. Uh, today, the rise of the top 1% which has taken place over the past uh, 30, 40 years is due to economic theory which says that this is good for everyone because uh, if the wealthy make wealth, it will trickle down to everybody even though this does not happen. So today, economic growth theory is all about trickle down which is a completely false theory but the point of this theory is to deceive the people into supporting the existing system of inequality. So when the global financial crisis occurred, we had four possible policy responses, three possible ones. One was monetarism, which says that you should respond to this crisis by expanding the money supply. And this is what was done. Trillions of dollars were given to banks and financial institutions. Uh, um, Atif Mia and Amir Sufi uh, analyzed this and said that the problem is coming from excessive debt and the solution is debt relief. Let the mortgagers, let them off, let the, give them some relief. Today, the student's body in the USA has $1 trillion of debt. And um, the only solution is really to cancel this debt. But this solution is not adopted because the people who have the debt, the creditors, are able to control those people who are in debt. And today, the students will spend their lives earning money for the uh, financial uh, sector. The Keynesian theory would say that you should expand aggregate demand, give more money to the people. So these are all three different policies which have different effects on different classes. But which policy was followed? The monetarism policy was followed because it was the most favorable for the financial sector. And it was, uh, the belief was created that this is the best policy for everyone. So this is the final point that I would like to make that basically <coughs> societies have things which are called collective intentions. What is our collective goal? And that is what social solidi solidarity produces. What do we all want to do together? But if you want to do something together, it cannot be done in a vacuum. It cannot be done by wishing. So uh, a collective intention can only be achieved by an institution. So that's why the institutions of a society are very important. And this is a list of social institutions in Islam in contrast with the comparing, uh, comparable institution in uh, a free market um, um, capitalist society. So I'm just going to go over briefly what these institutions are and why they are different. And uh, this will be, um, that, that's the last point that I would like to make. So, in an uh, Islamic society, the goal of the firm is not profit maximization, it's service maximization. So, when you have a competitive society and the firms are trying to do profit maximization, they're always trying to sell uh, high-priced uh, high goods of low quality to consumers. There is something called planned obsolescence. The firms actually, you can find the, the notes, the firms decided to make cars which would wear out in five years so that the uh, consumer gets to buy new cars so that they can keep selling. There is massive amount of waste. There's advertising which creates the desire in consumers to buy ridiculous goods. And so, in fact, one study showed that in um, last year in um, Australia, $1 million worth of products were purchased which were never opened. I mean, you bought buy this thing new, but you never actually open it to use it. Uh, as opposed to this, Islamic service-oriented firms, they seek to maximize service to the creation of God for the sake of the rewards of the Akhira. It doesn't mean that they don't earn money. They earn money, but the money is not, they don't maximize profits. They earn money so that they can pay their workers well, so that the workers can work well and enthuse with enthusiasm and they can work hard. So the whole intention of the firm is different. <laughs> In a profit maximization economy, you don't want to give anybody a monopoly because then they will uh, extract revenue. In particular, we have many examples where utilities were 
given to profit maximization permits that's that's today the fashionable thing to do that okay we should privatize electricity but in many places uh, the firms which uh, took over extracted so much revenue and caused so much pain that the public sector actually had to take it back you don't want to have somebody supplying an essential service on the basis of profit maximization like education <coughs> as opposed to this in islam throughout the centuries we had guilds guilds are collectives these are like monopolies but their goal is not to maximize profits their goal is to provide such service so for example consider a guild of doctors uh, so all the doctors are part of the medical association but their job is to make sure that every single citizen of the country say pakistan receives medical treatment so if there is anybody whether he is poor rich uh whatever if he is not receiving medical uh, treatment then the guild is responsible now the guild uh so if once the guild understand that this is the responsibility they will send people to rural areas because collectively their job is not to maximize profits but their job is to make sure that everybody receives service now the waqf versus the banks the waqf embodies social responsibility people uh, in islamic civilization if they had excess money they would build waqfs and these waqfs would be for social services so they understand that if i have more than i need i should give it to the people who have less than what they need so as opposed to this banks are uh, the embodiment of the collective intention of selfishness lack of caring for others you have lots of money you want to keep it for yourself you want even though people are starving in the streets you just keep it in your account and you eat uh, luxuriously and you enjoy luxury and you don't care about the other people who don't have homes and who don't have food and who don't have education who don't have medicine you don't care anything about that so this is what a bank is so in islam we have cooperative justice both parties are trying to implement the order of allah they are not trying to get the better of the other in um, the west you have adversarial justice it doesn't matter what the truth is it doesn't matter what justice is the side of the the goal of every side party is to win the case with any means fair or foul there was a question asked in but uh, in stanford law school to a panel of lawyers that if your client is a rapist and he is known to be guilty uh the and your only defense is to make an innocent woman seem like she is a prostitute will you do it so they said it is our moral responsibility to do it uh to produce yani evidence which makes the jury think that this woman has bad character uh because this will save our client and our job is not to get justice it is to get to save the, our client regardless of whether he is guilty or not so this was uh, the answer of stanford law school which included some females on it too now it is said to us that democracy is the best system but in democracy as many people have analyzed the majority can do whatever they want to the minority so the holocaust in which 6 million Jews were burnt. This included women, children, all innocent people were burnt to death. This was outcome of a democracy. The majority wanted it, so the minority had to be burnt. As opposed to this, the system of khalafa and shura, we are bound by the laws of Allah, so we cannot do any such thing. Also, the shura ensures that the decision is joint by as many members as possible. The goal is to try to create unanimity. Everybody should agree. So this is a very different system. There is the kafil versus insurance. The kafil is the idea of collective responsibility and cooperation, helping each other in the times of need. Insurance is an adversarial contract in which both sides are trying to get the better of the other. So if I have insurance, I will burn my house to collect the payments. And on the other hand, this is called moral hazard and adverse selection. The person who is the least healthy he will get the health insurance and the person who is healthy will not um, at the same time the insurance company is trying to minimize the payment they will try to make excuses and they'll try to 
pay you the less amount, the least that they can. So this, uh, the difference in the spirit, one is an adversarial gamble, the other is a cooperative and, and, and collective venture. So collective action is only possible through institutions. And today, uh, because as, as, as it was said that Islam came as a stranger and will become a stranger. So today the situation is like this because the institutions of the Islamic society are missing. And we have our, uh, our political system, our economic system, our social system, our, uh, our weddings and our funerals and our uh, markets uh, and all the institutions, they are governed by Western models. And that is why uh, we need desperately to build a new social science, uh, which I'm calling Ulum al Imran, because the social science of the West is built on the assumption markets and so on and so forth. And we don't want to use those institutions to build an Islamic society. So that's where I will end this talk. I think this is the last one. Hey, dear Professor Asad, thank you very much uh, for sharing this wonderful uh, uh, lecture. And it's really outstanding in this uh, era. So I would request to audience if they have any question they may ask. I think there is no question at the moment. So now I would request to uh, Professor uh, Kabir Hassan uh, to deliver his lecture. But before going to his lecture, I would love to introduce uh, Professor Kabir Hassan. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Kabir Hassan is a professor of finance in Department of Economics and Finance in the University of New Orleans, USA. He currently holds three endowed chairs, Herbena Professor of Economics and Finance, Hancock Whitney Chair Professor in Business, uh, and Bank One Professor in Business at University of New Orleans. Professor Hassan is winner of 2016 Islamic Development Bank Prize in Islamic Banking and Finance. Professor Hassan received his BA in Economics and, Mathem in, and Mathematics from Justus Adolf College, Minnesota, USA, and uh, MA Economics, PhD Finance from University of Nebraska, Lincoln, USA. Professor Hassan is a financial economist with consulting research and teaching experience in develop, development finance, money and capital markets, Islamic finance, corporate finance, investment, monetary economics, uh, microeconomics, Islamic banking and finance, and international trade and finance. Professor Hassan is a member of accounting and auditing organization for Islamic financial institutions, ethics and governance board and education board. He is also a member of, a member of Oxford University, Sad Business School, Faith-Based Invest, uh, Investing Initiative Advisory Board. Professor Hassan conducted, uh, consulted the World Bank, IMF, Islamic Development Bank, Asian Development Bank and many governmental and private organizations. Moreover, Professor Hassan has over third, uh, three, uh, uh, three decades of teaching and research experience and has published over 350 research papers in top tier journals like Journal of uh, uh, Banking and Finance, Journal of Corporate Finance, Pacific Asian Finance Journal, Quantitative Finance. He is a frequent traveler. Uh, Professor Hassan has presented over 450 research papers at professional conferences and has delivered 244 invited papers and seminars. For his outstanding research and scholarly work, Professor uh, Hassan has been recognized with Lifetime Achievement Award by UNO Research Council in 2019. Professor Hassan has supervised 64 PhD thesis and acted as an external examiner about 50 dissertations from different countries of, uh, like Australia, New Zealand, USA, India, Bangladesh, Malaysia, and Canada. Professor Hassan has also edited and published 
17 books this is the uh, introduction of professor uh, uh, kabir and no the session is over to you thank you very much for giving your time stable bismillahir rahmanir rahim assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh well uh, brothers and sisters um, good morning from new orleans it's about 6 almost 7 o'clock here and i'm sure it's very late night in where professor isa ghati is uh, you probably are listening to the war news uh, we just recently hit by hurricane ida it was a four category 4 hurricane when it hit the land and uh, the entire city of new orleans the surrounding areas are without power water and i am still in my house but we have a generator so for that reason i have electricity but no water and because of this i also have um internet so i hope it continues during my presentation if for some reason i get kicked out please <laughs> forgive me uh so uh you know i uh, there are some leading and living scholars um in the stomach economics and finance field and one of them is asad zaman whom i hold in very high respect and i res i he has a blog i ask all of you to read it he always sends to me and also he is a very original thinker so i learn a lot and it was a very wonderful presentation so today i just will focus or narrow down my talk just to the economic discipline maybe slightly a different take and i am also borrowing ideas from you know many scholars including mohammad akram khan from pakistan so um let me start with the, what is the state of islamic economic discipline so sometime we try to confuse islamic economics and islamic economics teachings so what is it islamic economics and islamic economics teachings now islamic economic literature has focused on the teachings of islam the literature is important but it has not developed islamic economics as an independent branch of social science now islamic economic teachings provide information on legal and ethical aspects of economic transaction and dealings from the Quran and Sunnah new literature should focus more on real life society and less on legal society by saying that i'm not saying that we do not know the real life society we need them but um well not the legal society we need them but we also have to look at what is going on in front of us so we are talking about homo economicus and homo islamicus so what is homo economicus the subject of conventional economics and everything that professor asad zaman spoke about in his deliberation but homo islamicus want to live in an islamic society while islamic society when i say it's not a muslim society it's a islamic values that prevails in the entire humanity since you are focusing on the islamic economic teachings our immediate concern is about its implementation in real life much of the past literature has focused on homo economicus the character of conventional economics to expand islamic economics we should focus on homo islamicus a character living in islamic society so there has been and attempt to put forward this ideal by many scholars living and dead but it has not been very successful but it is clear that there is a need to expand homo islamicus no longer i can islamic economist interpret and refine legal jargon so if muslim economists could detach themselves from the legal content islamic economists could enter the domain of social sciences and unfortunately most islamic economists struggle with this idea 
so here on the one x spectrum we have islam the social science of islamic economics in the context of ibn khaldun or you know puritan society on the other hand you have the islamic legal structure now it has been said again and again, and you know this, we focus too much on the ritualistic Islam at the expense of the spiritual Islam. So Islam is a complete code of life. We have to combine both the spiritual and the ritual. But very often, and very often I would say, the Muslims forget about the spiritual character of the Islamic teachings. Now, some of the useful work has been done in translating and editing earlier books on public finance. And of course, we boast about Ibn Khaldun, and that is a translation work. And Ibn Khaldun, as Professor Asad Zaman said, rightfully the father of economics, not Adam Smith. And actually, Adam Smith and the European scholars stole ideas from the Muslim scholars over the centuries without acknowledging them. However, these books are written by scholars in specific context and were in the nature of manuals. Even Ibn Khaldun, not in a modern jargon or economic language, but he has written in historical perspective in a truly social science uh, per perimeter or lens. Hope was that since these works are produced in the golden era of Islamic history, we may be able to learn something from them. And yes, we should. But the fact is that the whole literature is so much embedded in the temporal context within the time. There was hardly anything that we are able to learn from the perspective of a social science. So too many economists they try to create an Islamic copy of the conventional economics. Why do you have to compare Islamic economics with conventional economics all the time? Literature has found that Islamic economics has little to offer when only using conventional economics teachings. So the good economics, I always say, is Islamic economics. However, we try to prove that we have enough of basis for developing the subject and to teach conventional economics from Islamic perspective. Teaching Islamic economics as an add-on on conventional only created confusion. And Professor Azad Zaman is against it. And he advocates we, still, we have to start from new on our own methodology on other own premises. The glory of Islamic economics faded further as we tried to instill Islamic economic teachings as an addendum to conventional economics. If you look at any Islamic economics, banking or finance program at any of the university, there are out of the 10 courses you'll see, six of them are conventional subject and we add four of uh, additional fiqh uh, or muamalat and we call the Islamic economics banking or finance. That's not the way we'll be able to create a new social science. It has to come from the source and the source in the Quran and Sunnah have to start from there and build our own methodology. And of course, we will take whatever is good from other uh, discipline, but it has to be our own creation based our own Quran and Sunnah. But we have failed to do that so far. Issue number two, conventional economics and Islamic economics. An important issue in development of Islamic economics has been the formulation of a response toward conventional economics. There is no one response. Several responses have emerged over the years. One response is Islamic economics is a distinct academic discipline and has nothing to do with conventional economics. We need to discard conventional economics and focus only on Islamic economics. The idea received little support because of the absence of social science knowledge in Islamic economics. And another response was that we teach conventional economics as it is, but replace its basic assumption about human beings and economic system. 
we bring in Islamic economics and Islamic economy instead of homo economics and capitalism. And this idea has also found very little support. Still another response was that we teach conventional economics but integrate Islamic economic teaching at appropriate places to highlight inadequacies of the capitalist economics and to show the superiority of Islamic economic ideas. This approach caused confusion. There is a consensus on what is Islamic economics and what is conventional economics and how they fit together. So we need not to have a dispute with conventional economics as a social science. It has developed with the collective efforts of the thousands of scholars of our centuries. We should study it as it is and contribute if we like to do so. But by doing so, we should make Islamic economics a field of social science that stands alone. This will require a lot of work and dedication, curriculum development, new generation of Islamic scholars. So who is Islamic economics for? Who are the audience of Islamic economics? Are they Muslims only? Do we aim to study the economic problems of Muslim in wider sense? Or a new branch of knowledge which can be studied by anyone in the world? This argument has not led to consensus among Islamic economists. Now, Islamic economists who thought Islamic economics as an open knowledge were not free, free from the bias of creating something so much Islamic in nature that non-Muslims were deterred to benefit from it effectively. So if you look at any Islamic economics book, you see all conventional ideas, but we threw some ayat from the Quran or Sunnah and try to make it Islamic. Arabic words and phrases should be expressed in a more general and commonplace language, keeping them accessible to the wider knowledge community. And sometimes it is laden with so much Arabic word that the non-Muslims or those who come from a different tradition, they just simply just uh, drop it. They don't want to go further. There is a standard dictionary of Islamic economics which could provide standard meanings to most of our terms. Most of the books and documents on Islamic economics have to attach a glossary of terms used in the document. This shows the roadblock between open knowledge and Islamic economics. If we are to create open access, we should translate Islamic economics into more an accessible language, not English, Spanish or Arabic but rather general terms that are accessible to all. Our idea should make sense to everyone, Muslims and non-Muslims. Whether they agree or disagree is a different point. Let it be an open store of knowledge for everyone to study and everyone to contribute Muslim or not. So what should be the methodology of Islamic economics? So the conventional economic studies human behavior or construct a mental image through abstract thinking. And this leads to the thought is presented as a postulate in a language which either verifiable or falsifiable as Professor Zaman said logical positivism. Over a prolonged period the economists make repeated attempts to verify or falsify it. It is either verified or at least cannot be most falsified. At that stage, it becomes an economic law and the process continues. So the so-called Marxist dialogues, thesis, antithesis, synthesis that continues. This methodology is approached with the caution to Muslim economists. Verification or falsification Islamic postulates could expose the divine ordinance to human verification or falsification, which would be becoming a sacrilege. Therefore, this methodology is not suitable for Islamic economics. 
the idea has been perplexing the Muslim economists. They did not think of developing a social science from Islamic economic teachings. Instead of verifying or falsifying the divine tenets, they could move toward developing human understanding of these tenets, so-called fiqh mu'amalat and istihad. And the process of istihad has stopped long time ago. And that's one of the reasons that are going behind, even though we used to lead the entire world at one time, so-called during the golden age of Islam. They then transform that understanding into economic postulates and theories. They will begin to use a familiar method of verification and falsification, even though not perfect, but I would say one of the manifestation of this thought process is the creation of Riva free banking, even though it has his own problem, but at least we have started that istihad and hopefully one day we will really create a Riva free society. Issue number five, economic statements of the Quran. So the Quran states in several places that includes Al-Kitab and Al-Hikmah. The verses of the Quran related to economic issues can be placed into three main categories. Legal statements about permission and prohibition, Al-Halal wal haram the moral injunctions such as exhortation to give respite to the debtor if he or she is in financial distress. The so-called, if you give a loan to someone, Kardul Hassan, you give them time if the person cannot pay on time and you'll get the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, positive statements that point to some economic phenomenon through operation of the invisible hand of God. So we can say categories one and two are considered to be Al-Kitab and category three contains Al-Hikmah. Now these positive statements can be expressed as being the divine economic laws declared by God. Muslims believe that these laws operate during a lifetime by the divine will of God. We try to reach perfection but we may not reach perfection in this world and God doesn't want us to be perfect either. All he wants so that we keep trying to reach his satisfaction level. However, there is no evidence of how these laws take effect directly in the Quran. You know, in the Quran, Allah has forbidden riba and allowed trade, but nowhere he said, give me a bank. So the banking is a human creation. It is not known in a cause effect framework, how in fact charity leads to increase in income and wealth of the giver. Now, explanations of these statements have not yet been found in the familiar cause effect format. Quran uses words and phrases which may have multiple meanings. Mufasirun. Those who analyze Quran or Tafsir of the Quran have had multiple interpretation over the centuries. If you read Quran, I was told by one Buzurgo that if you read Quran, every time you read Quran, you'll come up with a new meaning of it. Allah guides you to the proper meaning. A conclusive interpretation which can be tested empirically is normally unavoidable. Determining the meanings of the Quran, economic teaching. The determining the meaning of the Quranic economic statements in a manner that allows the verification of our understanding in the light of real life data is needed. And this is where we can make a positive social science. So Islamic economics should focus on the economic statements of the Quran and the Hadith, the methodology that should be followed as a, an advice for this is as follows. Muslim economists should consider Quran verses that relate to economic issues as fixed. So we cannot change any single comma or period from the Quran. The focus should be 
on comprehending a cause and effect mechanism in order to operate the Quran verses as opposed to testing the truth of them. To identify the main terms of each statement in terms of understanding through a process of research, discussion, brainstorming, and intensive thinking, a compilation of this of the possible meanings can be derived and will be subject to revision as there becomes a deeper understanding of the subject matter. Several postulates should be created and edited over time. A short list of postulates should be created that adhere to a set of standards of verifiability and falsifiability. Only postulates or data can be collected should be included in this list. Let me interject one point here. Right now there's a race among the Muslim economists or finance professional, those who work in the academia, to publish in Q1 or high impact journals. I can tell you they are not a single journal purely dedicated to Islamic finance or economics such as competed one of the top uh, tier journals. So what we do, we keep selling our soul to different journals by trying to run empirical data. Even I'm guilty for that. At the end of the paper, yes, I get it accepted and I try to tell a story, but then I ask for what is Islamic finance in this paper? What is Islamic economics in this paper? So we are going through a transition phase and we really need to rethink our research agenda and we need to try to promote a set of journals where we can communicate our ideas among ourselves and bring the Western scholars to this fold as well. Now, economic statements of the Quran, empirical data should be collected on each postulate for specific regions and time periods. The goal is to verify or falsify each postulate. The postulate that is verified and cannot be falsified should be considered as a proven understanding in the study. These truths will provide a real understanding of the verse set of verses that form the basis of the postulate. Let me give you just a current um, um, information you may or may not know. Dr. Amza Sakib of Akhwat, I just came to know this morning that he won the Ramon Magasize uh, Award for his purely work of e using the interest-free loan as a way of poverty alleviation. I do not know whether he directly ascribes to the Quranic teaching, but the whole idea of interest-free loan is coming from Islam and he's showing to the world that works in the context of Pakistan. So as an example, how you can try this Quranic teachings, how it works and show the world, look, this is the book of Hikmah, this is the real book, this is the guideline for everyone, you know, and, and Sharia is a manual, based upon the Quran and Sunnah. So we, we, we Muslims really have to prescribe or, or preach these uh, teachings to the rest of the world, but at the same time, we have to practice it. What we have become, the Muslim world, a nation of preacher, but not practicer. We do not practice our own values, but the rest of the world practices it, and they are moving ahead, faster ahead than we are, uh, and we are getting behind. For example, Verses 2-276 says that Allah deprives riba of all blessings and formulate our understanding of the term Yamhaq Allah al riba in the following statements. All types of loan interest results in the reduction of a country's social wealth. Consumption loan interest results in the reduction of the lender's wealth. Deferred payment interest from a sales contract results in the reduction of the seller's wealth in the long term. International loan interest result in higher poverty of the borrowing country. So this list serves as an example of a postulate. Other postulates can be shortlisted in a similar manner. So postulates can now be tested in this manner. This will arrive at a theory that is incapable of being falsified or can be verified by empirical evidence. Postulates that adhere to the standard will bring conducive meaning 
of the Quranic statement will also provide true information about the definitions of riba and mahak. The usual procedure for drawing policy implications from this understanding can proceed. So what is the subject matter of Islamic economics? Now from the previous discussion, we can now state that Islamic economic subject matter is to study the economic statements in the Quran and Sunnah. The study of this will help us discover the moral economic laws which are operational in the world. And these laws are operational, operated through human behavior and are functional in a cause effect framework. Despite this, there has not been a way to determine these laws in a cause effect format. For example, Allah says that in fact, Fisabe Lilla leads to increase in a person's income and wealth. How this happens through, core, through a cause and effect framework is still not known. These moral laws have been operating throughout the world since the beginning of time. Nonetheless, discovering these laws in the cause effect framework has yet to be discovered, and moral laws of economic prosperity and misery have been subject of theology so far. So we need to move it from theology to social science where we can prove this with data that this is indeed the word of God and is good for all humankind. So out of fo our focus is to develop Islamic economics as a social science. And to do this, we need to discover these laws and introduce them to the world for verification or falsification. And this act will be a welcome contribution for human welfare. The objective for Islamic economy should be to examine these laws and Muslim economists should focus on various economic statements of the Quran and Hadith to determine a deeper understanding of them. The objective for this is to find moral laws of Allah that deal with the economic aspects, which are the, which are the creation and distribution of income and wealth and the economic problems resulting from resource scarcity. Another important area of inquiry is determining a means of measuring the various term meaning and concepts of the Quran and Hadith. What are the definitions of by Israf, Tadbir, Bukhul, Alafu, Shukur, Tawba, Hayal, Tayeba, Fasad, Fil, Ard, etc. This would lean to the creation of a standard Islamic economics and finance dictionary. Once Muslim economists adopt Islamic economic subject matter, the conflict with conventional economics would be eliminated and both social sciences could coexist and the better will prevail in the long term. Islamic economic subject matter would be accessible to anyone for further study or contribution and you would not require faith in Islam. So what is a definition of Islamic economics? And I'm using this definition from Muhammad Akram Khan. Islamic economics is a social science that integrates human understanding of divine sources of knowledge into the study of economic problem. Islamic economics is a social science. It is not theology. Islamic economics does not have mandatory link with Islamic economy because we do not know what is called an Islamic economy, what is the minimum or maximum that must prevent in Islamic economy. And you are familiar with a, a study by two George uh, uh, Washington University that they have analyzed a you know, number of countries in the world on the basis of Islamic values and related, related data. And they found you know, the top 30 countries are non-Muslim majority countries. They follow the Islamic postulates, even though they are not Muslims. So Islamic economists do not necessarily require an Islamic economy to test its hypotheses and theories. You know, it's not necessary, but you, if you believe this, you, you will get the um, baraka of this concept. Islamic economics focuses on the human understanding of divine text. It, Islamic economics comes out the fear 
of trespassing any divine order by testing and verification methods of social sciences. There is human economic problem, scarce means and multiple ends. Islamic economics looks for the solution for the economic problem of man that arises from scarcity of means and multiplicity of ends. Positive science, the definition clarifies Islamic economics both as a normative, also as a positive science, as Professor Asad Zaman alluded to. It is a positive science. Its findings can be used by policymakers, as in the case of conventional economics. So here is a, a slide that I borrowed from Salman Syed Ali. Actually, he very nicely summarized of the different school of thoughts that uh, exist in the Islamic economics arena. So the first one, I'm, I'm talked about uh, in, in my um, presentation so far. You add Islamic elements within the conventional system and you try to make it Islamic or Islamize it. Second one, you work on institutional change because Islamic system calls for a different institution. So this is so-called institutional framework on Islamic economics. You know, Professor Habib Ahmed and others are following that route. Third one is work on social finance instead of commercial finance. Those who frown upon commercial Islamic finance, they said, well, it has the form but not the essence, so we need to focus more on Islamic social finance to bring fala for everyone. And the fourth uh, thought process is work on environmental issues and circular economy because this is closer to Islamic finance. Uh, uh, Dr. Tariqullah Khan and others also following the tradition. And I must tell you, this circular economy is getting traction in the Western economic thought as well. Number five, work on Islamic moral economy uh, at the philosophical level. The Muhammad, Muhammad Asute and others are also following that tradition. That's the way they try to define Islamic economics. Number six, they create a new paradigm by rejecting everything conventional and build on different mindset. And this is what our own brother Asad Zaman is propagating. You start afresh. And finally, that I try to sort of synthesize, focus on ways to address social and economic challenges using Islamic principle and trying to make it both normative and positive economics. So awareness among the stakeholders, including public and lack of talent pool required for the industry is still a challenge. So I want to bring a little bit uh, Islamic finance, which is, which is a subsector, a very small sector of Islamic economics. So we have lack of innovation. We all agree. We are revolving around Sharia compliance, not Sharia based essence. They're oblivious of social impact, everything that you do, our action, Islamic financial product system that you try to create. We are not considering the environment. We're using conventional benchmark and show uh, in, while well, we are very slow in technology integration, technology is moving, lack of uniform Sharia governance code applicable, no model law applicable for Islamic finance that could be localized. So what are the recommendations? There are a few that I want to say. We align with Makasid of Sharia. We merge Islamic commercial finance with Islamic social finance. We focus on achieving sustainable development goals. We link with the circular economic notion. We initiate law harmonizing efforts and we develop a model Islamic finance law that will give certainty in cross-border transactions. And I want to borrow another from my own organization, AFI, where I'm serving on their ethics and governance board. We really need to bring Adal and Ihsan together, having the right intention and the right mindset. We have to add doing the right thing on the top of this, plus doing it in the right manner, plus engaging with others positively, and that is the Adal al Ihsan, and that is the, the fulcrum of highest objective of Islamic economics. So we have these four challenges facing Islamic finance. 
you know, we have communication gap, misconception, misunderstanding, and misplaced notion of Islamic finance and economics must be removed through awareness and advocacy program. The second one is a trust gap. The Islamic social business and impact investing should be emphasized to remove the tension among the stakeholders of the Islamic finance industry. Then we have the innovation gap balance between macro and micro makasid should be maintained the so-called form versus substance debate or financial engineering. And finally, talent gap, a new brand of scholars who are well versed in Islamic jurisprudence and secular financing techniques and mechanisms must be nurtured. So that is all, my dear friend. I want to acknowledge the writings of various authors over the years from whom I have benefited immensely and those ideas have mingled with mine in this presentation. <coughs> Wassalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Thank you very much, Professor Kabir, uh, for this wonderful uh, lecture. We have two, uh, I think, participants. They have questions. Uh, first is Muhammad Irfan. Uh, Muhammad Irfan, your mic is, uh, you, you can ask question. Unmic your, unmute your mic and you may ask question. Muhammad Irfan, Irfan Chani, are you here? Okay, we have another participant. He has also have a question, but his name is unknown. Yes, you're, uh, you can unmute your mic and ask question if there is a question. By you, how do I close my presentation? You can just oh, click sorry. on the. Yes, sir. Uh, can you hear my yeah. voice? Yes. Yes. Uh, I am Dr. Azim, uh, working as assistant professor here in University of Lahore. Uh, I am basically uh, working in this area of sustainable development from last four or five year produced, I have produced top tier papers in different environmental management and some kinds of energy economics. So, so being as a Muslim, uh, I have a curiosity to work that uh, I should find out some potential research papers. I am interested to produce potential research papers, primarily that the subject area which I am working and how can I integrate, my question is that, how can I integrate uh, or what are the food for thoughts where I should work uh, with sustainable development in context of Islamic ideologies? Excellent question. I ask uh, Brother Asad Zaman to take it, delete first, okay? Then I'll say a few words. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me say it was a very inspiring talk there were many many important topics that you have raised that are worthy of following up in particular one thing that you said was uh, something that i have thought about but never actually written down it's very worth writing especially i think we could work on it the idea that how does infaq lead to increased wealth actually the answer is quite obvious think of a society in which everyone is only concerned with their own uh, personal self. So I have to save money for every medical emergency. So suppose that, you know, for example, cancer occurs only for a one person, a hundred thousand, which is something like that. And you need a lot of money. So now everybody has to save money for their own emergency. But in a society where we are helping each other, we only need to save collectively, collectively for one emergency because uh, whenever somebody is in need, the other people will be spending on him. So in general, you can think that 
in a society where everybody is my family, I have much less need to worry about the future. So this is one, I mean, you can, you can um, actually formalize it in terms of insurance. So that's, that's uh, one thing that I think there is a definitely very worthwhile um, work research that can be done both in terms of empirical and theoretical. So now to get back to the sustainable development, I have, um, uh, um, I think I have about three papers on this topic uh, on sustainable development from Islamic framework. And in these papers, I have also listed a, a lot of references and given a lot of open questions. So if you look for through my blog or you can write to me if you don't find and I will send you the papers. So that's uh, uh, what I would like to say over to you. Uh, yeah, brother, the, the, the thrust of your question is you want to do some research trying to merge or combine the sustainable development gold with Islamic ones so that you can publish in a good journal. If that yes, is sir. your objective, <laughs> yes, sir. I, I think this is, uh, I know you must be a very young scholar, so you need to publish, you need to get promotion, and you need to be recognized. But you know, I'm a little bit older than you, and I have come to the conclusion that is a futile exercise. Uh, I have written so many empirical papers, now I'm tired of them. And, uh, um, you know, in Islamic finance, in order to publish in a top journal, you really need to have data, some sort of logical positivism or Chicago School of Thought thinking. But there are very little you can do really because data simply is not there. And who says that Islamic finance or economics is not sustainable development economics or finance? By definition, it is the good economics. It's supposed to incorporate all these ideas. Now, in order to do this top level uh, theoretical or empirical work, you need support. You tell me in Pakistan or the country I come from, Bangladesh, what percentage of national budget is geared towards research and development? I know we have the advisor to the Prime Minister Imran Khan, Professor Asad Zaman. You know this one country, tiny country, Israel, has research and development budget more than the research and development budget of 57 countries. So how do you expect to beat the Jewish scholars? They will work day and night, they have the support mechanism, and they are ahead of everything. You know, we talk about Islamic finance, Sharia compliant mutual fund. If you look at the fund that you invest in, the majority are owned by the Jewish people and they are very Sharia compliant. So what I'm trying to say, yes, uh, you try to do, but as I've been saying, and also probably this is an opportunity, I'll take this forum to ask and request brother Asad Zaman, you know, build a, a set of journal, you know, that who will be able to promote our ideas and bring the other Congress from our side. If we try to publish in El Shabir and top journals, we have a race for it. And there is also perverse incentive. We are selling our soul, some of our doing very unethical things in the process. You really need to stop this. So I, I know I did not answer it. I did not tell you the things you wanted to hear, uh, uh, but this is the state of the world I, we are in right now. So if you want to publish in good journal, you have to go through this process, you know, try to find data, try to find an angle, how you can find religions as DG. You know, one yes, of these papers that we have written recently, you know, how we can make Sharia compliant, I mean, Sharia screening, if we add this with EAG screening, we can make it a better. So any story I try to tell, we have to be tell this as a complement to the conventional system. Rather, we stand our own feet. So this is the uh, state we are in because we do not have research fund. We cannot do this high impact research. If you are a student at uh, Harvard or MIT, where uh, Zasazan went, if a professor thinks today that he has an idea and he needs money, the money is not a uh, problem. But you know, in Pakistan universities or Bangladesh universities, even you fight for a paltry sum of money. So we really need to invest in our future in research and development. And this is would be my honest request to the, all the Islamic leaders in the world. Sorry, brother, this is not exactly the answer you wanted to hear, but uh, this is uh, what I feel. 
Sir, thank you, sir. My uh, objective uh, was not that I am publishing top journals. Uh, the basic curiosity was that uh, being as a Muslim, that we must have uh, literally uh, contribute in our own aspects, in our own Islamic fundamentals. That is basically the hurdle or constraints which I normally feel when I make my decisions that I should work in that domain. So that was you basically should. the best. You should. You should continue doing this. But at the same time, you, you are if you're a young scholar, you need to get your, you know, this Pakistani system. You have this system, WX. Professor Kabir, your mic got muted by accident. Well, what I'm trying to say is that that incentive mechanism has to be changed within Pakistan as well. What you are doing, I really congratulate you. I commend you for doing this. But the question is, you're not getting the due recognition. Uh, I mean, among your scholars, so the friends, because everybody is so, you know, uh, attuned to publishing in Q1, Q level journals and so on, because the incentive is coming from higher education of Pakistan. They tell you you have to publish in certain level of journals. Otherwise, you don't get promotion, you don't get money. So we have to do a lot of work, okay? And unfortunately, you know who are telling you all these things, Pakistan Higher Education Commission, all the big boss come from the al Shabir Wiley, and they are coming and telling you, hey, we have to maintain the quality, but what quality? You know, I have published so many papers in Q1, you know, ISI, and very often I ask myself, I feel guilty, what the hell I'm doing? You know, I'm trying to write this paper and investing my own energy. And then I ask myself, what is Islamic finance or Islamic economics in my paper? Sorry, brother. Yes, this sure. is, I'm getting very emotional. So this is all I can tell you. And my brother, uh, Asad Zaman, want to share something? Yes, well, you have raised a very, 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 very central issue at the heart of the lives of the academics. The fact is that the system in used for evaluation is thoroughly corrupt in Pakistan. And um, actually, same is true for the whole world. The studies in top journals show that the uh, access to top 10 is, is available only to a very small click. And they read each other's papers and referee each other's papers and very distinguished, high-quality papers which are against the mainstream cannot get published. So that's a, that's a problem. And um, one solution is to compromise, which uh, everybody does to some extent, that yes, okay, we hide our genuine agenda and we try to play along with whatever the storyline is that is currently dominant. And uh, actually, Mahbub al wrote about the seven sins of development problems, <clears throat> one of them was to go along with the current fashion, which keeps changing. <clears throat> but the other is to try to develop your own field. This is also, it's also an inter entirely different set of problems. There you get lots of wacky and weirder papers, no quality control, and a lot of, um, so, so both alternatives are uh, beset with difficulties. A solution is possible, but it requires basically collective effort of academics. See, if you think about what happened to the heterodoxy in economics in the USA, they have been completely wiped out. It's not because the heterodoxy doesn't have any good ideas. They have lots of good ideas. The Marxists, the post-Keynesians, uh, the, even this uh, uh, so-called donut economics, this is brilliant ideas, but none of them are accepted in the mainstream and none of them get uh, published in high-ranking journals. So uh, how to create a sustainable knowledge revolution? This is really a problem. And I think that, um, that uh, I am working on some aspects of the solution. And I think you have pointed out some others, but it requires a lot of thought and effort and collective action. Some institution is required to implement a concrete proposal and take it towards a solution, which includes money, as you said. <laughs> Dear professors, uh, 
may we take the questions at the end of session because our one of speaker is from Austria, Australia and there is almost mid of night. And I think uh, after his talk, we can have a great discussion. Please suggest Professor Kabir and Professor Asazaman may we have a discussion at the end of session. Yeah, that's a good that. idea. Actually, that's what I was worried about because Isaac Bhatti brother, he needs to go to bed pretty soon. Yes, yes. So ask, uh, invite brother Isaac Bhatti, please. Assalamu alaikum, Professor Isaac, are you there? Yeah, he's here. Hi, Professor Isaac. Okay. Hello, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My goodness, <laughs> what a wonderful discussion. And <laughs> <laughs> Euro Central Asad Zaman ecosystem and on the footstep of Ibn Khaldun and then my brother <laughs> Kabir Hassan. The seventh important issue, various top journals research agenda and also focus more on social finance, notion of circular economy, nothing is left for me. <laughs> Okay. So uh, I have something to discuss about you. First of all, I wanted to uh, share your profile with our audience. Please. Please. Then we will uh, discuss. Then you can discuss about your. Uh, you can share your thoughts. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Ishaq Bhatti is a professor of finance and financial econometrics, and the founding director of Islamic Banking and Finance Program at Lothar University, Aust uh, Melbourne, Australia. Currently, he is graduate research coordinator for the Department of Economics, Finance and Marketing in the same university. Previously, he has taught in various universities of Australia, New Zealand, USA, Germany, Japan, Middle East and Pakistan. Professor Ishaq is extensively publishing in top tier journals and to date he has published over 130 research papers, eight books and contributed to encyclopedias and uh, he is a member of editorial board of various international well reputed journals. Professor Ishaq has over three decades teaching and research experience. His contribution towards teaching excellence has been recognized with several awards at school level, faculty, university and national levels. His teaching and research interests are in Islamic finance, quantitative maths for business research, uh, data analytics, Financial Econometrics and st Statistics. He is a regular co-organizer of international conference, conferences, including World Islamic Economic and Finance Conference, uh, Minhaj University since 2018 and 11th Foundation of Islamic Finance Conference in 2021. Furthermore, he has served as an advisory board member of National Zakat Foundation of Australia and works closely with Islamic social, uh, Islamic counseling of Victoria and non interest loans. Kard uh, Hasna, Islamic and social microfinance. He is currently editing Rotledge Islamic business and finance book series. He was involved in advising Saudi, uh, Saudi capital market mutual funds, Turkey uh, Central Bank training 2013, Islamic Development Bank, Australian. Research Council Discovery Grant, International Center for Education and Islamic Finance, University of Malaysia. Professor uh, Ishaq also appeared in international media, including the Australian, uh, the Age, Sydney, uh, Sydney Morning, Brisbane Time, uh, Brunei Times, The Economist, The New York Times, Bloomberg and appeared on the Indonesia and Uzbekistan national TV. This is the brief profile of Professor uh, Ishaq. Now session is over to you. 
thank you very much for your time and uh, uh, your availability thank you well, thank you very much for this introduction actually basically um i learned islamic economic and finance when i was uh, 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 at International Islamic University Islamabad from Dr. Ziauddin Ahmed and these Munawar Iqbal, Sayyid Tahir, and they used to be there. So I learned Islamic economic and finance, but unfortunately I got a scholarship from doing a master in statistics and probability theory from University of Alberta in Canada. So some of the other I've been forced into that area on the basis of scholarship. And since my training is in the in probability distribution like Asad Zaman have, and I learned econometric from ABUS and some of the top, top econom econometrician. And later on, when I moved to Australia, and in Australia, I got a very good ground of, of working on Islamic institution, particularly Islamic Council of Victoria. And with my, st my statistics training and Islamic uh, attachments, and some basic training of Islamic economics from International Islamic University, Islamabad, where um, as a Professor Asad Zaman was served as a director general as well. So that's why my Islamic finance background goes back uh, since the mid 80s. And also I work as a research assistant for Khurshid Ahmed and uh, uh, Professor Anis Ahmed when I was a young uh, in International Islamic University. So my dear, today's my presentation is related to Islamic finance in Australia, what we did, and being a Muslim minority, and how a secular Australia uh, introduced Islamic finance. So some introduction, then why Islamic finance in Australia, Muslims of Australia, what we are doing here, lesson for Pakistan and some concluding remarks. So this is not a philosophical lecture, it's more in applied how to survive in a Muslim minority countries and how to be active Muslim academics who can contribute contribute. So this is a lesson as well for those who are living in the Western countries and they can see what we can do for Islam and Islamic movements. So a bit history of uh, Australia. Uh, you guys know what these photographs look like. You can see as uh, Professor Asadzma mentioned, colonialization took place and you can see British taking care and bringing the criminals to Australia and also the slaves from Indian subcontinent who fought for the independent war in 1857. They came here as a refugee and slave migrant who have been forced here to work in the railway and farms as a slaves. And when they moved here in Australia, these criminals move here, they look into that Australia is a huge country. There are 800 communities living there, uh, Aborigines, and of course, some of them were Muslim so living here, you know, uh, with the neighboring countries, Indonesia and other migrants communities were living across these area in the, in the coast area. And they realized that, oh my goodness, so this in coast area, and they realized that this is a very fertile country. They settled down, they started developing these countries, and across these region, this area in the middle, on my right hand side, the 80% of the population lives. So this whole Australia, you can see 800 communities live there. They speak 600 languages in this whole com con uh, continent. And then these British colonialists and some of the criminals who came in this country, they massacred them and they killed most a lot of the communities. They abolished their languages. So this is Australia's background. Then these criminals start building this country into the following direction. They said, oh, Islamic finance in the world is good going place. And there was a global financial crisis at that time. And our day, the first conference there. Uh, and uh, I launched Islamic finance program on the grant with Professor Muhammad Arif at Monash University. We launched Islamic finance first conference uh, asking the government that there is a demand into the future and there is a hope for and direct foreign investment into the Australia. We need to set up Islam, some sort of Islamic finance infrastructure. So the government agreed. They started, they collaborated with us. Arif, uh, re Professor Arif retired, moved to back to Malaysia, Singapore, and I keep on working in these directions. 
So we realized that there was a lot of financial institution and in Australia, one of the state, Victoria, where I live in Melbourne, the government gave us some sort of taxation, uh, taxation uh, relaxation, and they said, okay, set up Islamic finance in Australia. So we set up first halal Islamic finance, and then there was a Islamic banking and finance in the mi Middle Eastern. They started investing into the Australia on the basis of interest free investment, but they were asking double digit return on infrastructure development. And also some of the South Asian countries like Malaysia, Singapore, Korea, and Taiwan, they wanted to invest in, in Islam on the basis of Islamic banking and finance in infrastructure. Some of the South Asian countries, for example, India and some of the Pakistani, they also were interested to invest. And some Arabs came in as well. So they set up, we call it MCC, Muslim Community Corp of Australia. They set up Hijaz Islamic Finance. They set up Islamic Capital Financial Institution and some institution and Islamic Home Loan was established. And so, so there was some experience from uh, UK experience of Islamic finance and French experience where we learn a lot of things. And we try to copy some of these instruments here in Australia, but the due to taxation regime, things were very difficult. And Westpac Bank started to do something and National Australia Bank started to do something, but they could not succeed. But there was one institution called LM Investment Management. They built up some sort of Aleph fund, mutual fund, which gave during a financial crisis, uh, crisis it gave a double digit return that make it popular because these Aleph fund invested on, in assets. So assets inflated soon after global financial crisis, which resulted in a double digit return. So that motivated the Australian government to invest some infrastructure, develop some infrastructure of Islamic finance. So that's why they got interested into Islamic finance. So the Minister of Finance and they came up, he gave some, he gave us a speech and then there's the Minister of Investment came up, Kuwait Finance House set up here, Christian uh, Wealth set up, Barca Investment, they set up their branches. So a lot of movement keep on coming here based on Sharia. What was the future of Islamic finance in Australia? The resources related services infrastructure, Islamic finance and agro base, mineral resources, oil, gas, iron core and education industry was the places where direct foreign investment took place. Approximately, approximately, you know, one billion Muslims are surrounded in Australia. If you look into MENA market and Middle Eastern countries and all, and most of these people are sending their children here and they were buying a property. Islamic banks are expected to account 40 to 50 percent they realized and the population was growing and high demand is taking place. In Australia, the Muslim population was growing better than the rest of the faith religious population. Therefore, they were started asking for an halal investment and they were pressurizing. The voters were pressurizing the government that we are interested in some sort of Islamic finance investment as well. So this motivated the government to start Islamic finance and make Australia as an Islamic finance hub, hub for the Asia Pacific region. So they estimated that Australia need $2.8 trillion for the next 10 years for infrastructure uh, development. For that reason, they needed foreign investment on the basis of uh, Islamic finance. So the thing was not easy. The problem was the investor was looking into it and they have to pay the stamp duty again on double step, double GST they have to pay. They have to pay, they, there was no tax deduction on any of the Islamic financial uh, instruments. So therefore, a lot of uncertainty. The government was a bit worried why people are not invested. They set up a, a group, including uh, from the industry as well as academia. I, I was one of the part of that group. We did a lot of investigation and it took eight years to set up. The group started in 28, uh, 2010 and 
took eight years to find out taxation uh, discussion and taxation uh, discussion paper, which motive, which recommended the government that we need to take certain steps to attract the uh, direct foreign investment as well as infrastructure investment into Australia. So the government looked into very seriously and they implemented in 2018 from 1st July 2018 year. Um, we agree that Mudarba, Musharka and Real Estate Investment Trust is on the basis of Sharia is allowed and these taxation uh, in profit should be treated as an interest for tax deduction purposes, as well as no double uh, GST is required, no more double stamp dipti when you are selling and buying things. So they agreed and level playing field was set up between conventional finance and Islamic finance footing. And then from 2019, uh, government start attracting some sort of funding in this direction. To do that, during the, the last eight years, what we were doing, we set up Australian Zakat Foundation. We set up Kardi Hasna, no interest loan. We set up home, Islamic home loans, which were not required by the government. And people were treating that, that that profit should be treated as interest. So in this, in their books, the Islamic financial institutions start saying that this is uh, an interest, but in fact, it was uh, on on, uh, on the basis of Mudarba and Musharka. Some business loan was working, working. Some major banks were interested into it. For example, National Australia Bank start, started wholesale Islamic finance product. So that's why slowly, slowly these things started. The interesting thing was the zakat motivated the government to understand what people are doing here. So let me show you some sort of our zakat structure, what we did it for the last eight years while government was thinking on Islamic finance and Sharia regulation. Our gener generational change programs for the long term growth and well being of our Australian Muslim community, we negotiated for with the government that tax should be tax deductible. So if any Muslim is paying zakat, his zakat should be tax deductible. Then they were an issue that why, uh, why not a Christian and non-Muslims who pay um, zakat, is it? We said, no, zakat is only for the Muslims. We try to tell them. And the government understand and some sort of relaxation was given to the Muslim communities that any donation towards zakat can be tax deductible in their annual taxation system. So from 2013 till 2018, we generated approximately $10 million and we distributed 13,832 cases we received within Australia. And we addressed some of the domestic violence, financial hardship people were having, some of the homelessness, their husband beat the woman and the children, they leave the house and they were on the footpath. We helped them to give them some sort of housing. So we try to understand there are a lot of problem within the Muslim community, even though government is giving a lot of financial benefit. So we provided some medical assistance, some overseas students and refugees who are not qualifying for the government funding. We give them some funds as well. So this product were very helpful. The Minister of Financial Services look into it and he said, is there any other products you guys are doing? I said, yeah, we are doing Karde Hasna Australia. Uh, we presented this diagram to him that called Islamic Council of Victoria, Kardesna, no interest loan scheme model. We made a partner bank as a partner who can provide as a capital grant money they give it to us. We had an Islamic Ulma board as a Sharia advisor. We had a family housing who, who gave us some operational grant to set up some offices and other facilities. We set up a manager and in the office of Islamic Council of Victoria, and we became a partner with a Christian group, Good and Shepherd, and a Christian and a Jewish group as a partner because in Jewish Judaism and Christianity, no interest loan is also encouraged. So this product helped 
all the non-Muslims living in Australia to be eligible to apply for no interest loan. We have seen some of the women's old women coming to the mosque and they were shifting that the Muslim terrorists, but they're giving them money without interest. So we had a loan assessment committee on the four to five, six people. We evaluate, we allocated loan to them and the deduction was taken fortnightly through the central link program direct to debit payment. And this is the program which I demonstrated to Dr. Amjus Hakib when we started uh, 10 years ago, and he was very impressed. But they were not doing on the basis of computer, they're doing in the mosque on the basis of registered. And we share a lot of information. I'm just Hakeb and myself, we share a lot of information. What we are doing every year when I go to Minhat, I end up meeting with Amjad Hakeb. We do what is the budget, what we are doing at the moment. So during this month, we had uh, on average, we have around approximately so many number of loans. So you can see the number of loans are increasing from May to June, July, August, and it keep on increasing because this is our monthly loan demand which is taking place. Australian government initiated lessons. Australian government, Australian trade, our trade give us some funding and then we said there was a Zadun Ibrahim Sharia law company was established in 2010 and they were helping the government as well. So Pakistani Muslim population is 12 times more than the Australian population. OK. When the issue of making money comes, then no discrimination between Muslim and non-Muslims. As Dr. Kabir Hassan said, the non-Muslim living in the community should be benefited with the burqa of Islamic economics and finance. And we have seen this burqa here in Australia. We are a Muslim minority. We are only less than 2% of the community. But due to our work and we are involved in the government, academia and the social welfare, Christian group, Judah, Judaism group and Hindu group as well. They are impressed with our work and due to this, the government Sharia regulation and Sharia board and also the government is understanding Imam board on each city. We had a Imam board every city and every state. This is helping us to contribute positive impression to an Australian Muslim and there are a lot of lessons from Pakistan and the Muslim communities that we should live together to demonstrate the burqa of Islamic economic and finance and the wider community, no matter what faith and religion they have. And Australia is a lucky country because Australia is rich in mine and mineral and uh, industry and relative to Pakistan or other Muslim countries. But remember, they were criminals who came in, who started helping and building up these structures. And now the Muslim migrants who came, they are equally shareholder in these lands and these uh, natural resources. Uh, these are the Muslim communities who are working, even the Pakistani Students Association. So we all work together as a community here. This is my lab where I am demonstrating how Islamic finance in Australia and Islamic financial institution can be run and also on Sunday, well, I open a mutual fund of GCC continue to demonstrate to my colleagues that this is a Sunday. All the market is closed, but the market in the Middle East is working. And so I was demonstrating to them into in, into my financial lab. These are some of the ambassadors who join us in there in our struggle. Some of my PhD students who graduated and they're working elsewhere. And this is latest uh, news. We we were latest in the news uh, about uh, Islamic finance uh, in the in the major media. So I just take uh, close and I just show you what's happening in the media uh, recently uh, because National Australia Bank has launched uh, Islamic finance product on a let's see. You. So they just launched it, Islamic finance product. See, so in the 6th of August, can you see my PowerPoint slides? On the 6th of August, National Islamic Bank tap into Islamic finance market with Sharia compliance loans. You can see. So one of my speech came up here, and when I started, and these are some of my students 
and these these are the Muslim uh, uh, you know businessmen who are there into the news and this is one of my students who is running Hijaz finance and some of these issues are related. So this is a lesson for Pakistanis to learn to live together in a community where you can convey a positive message of Islam and hence a practical things are demonstrated into this community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. It's hot. Jakla khair. Yeah. If if there is any question from audience, they may ask, please. I think people are tired. <laughs> yeah. Like me. Like me. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, any question from uh, any discussion point from our uh, guest speakers? No, they are free to make a discussion. Well, that was a very inspiring lecture. Uh, a lot of very practical, on the ground, hands on work. Uh, congratulations. Thank you, you Asad Bhai. So I would now I would uh, like to request uh, our head of department, Muhammad, uh, Dr. Muhammad Ziaullah, uh, to conclude this session and uh, give vote of thanks to our participants as well as uh, guest lectures, uh, guest uh, speakers. Yes. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa rahmatullahi wa Here is Dr. Ziaullah, Chairperson of uh, Department of Business Administration, Ghazi University, DG Khan, Punjab, Pakistan. First of all, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for all the uh, invited experts, guest speakers, uh, Professor Asad Zaman. Uh, Professor Muhammad Kabir Hassan and Professor Muhammad Isahak, uh, Isahak Bhatti. Uh, thank you very much. The lecture was very wonderful and inspiring. Uh, we have learned many things uh, from uh, from uh, from uh, from you uh, uh, from your uh, from you, and we are able to understand many things regarding. Islamic economics, uh, like uh, uh, we understand the progress of Islamic finance and economics uh, in in last uh, seven decades, and then we are able to understand the deficiencies which uh, has been facing by Islamic finance and economics uh, towards uh, transforming this knowledge into social sciences, business management, and we also. Uh, able to understand the uh, uh, recreating Ibn Khaldun approach to the social sciences and business management towards business management. We further we able to understand the impo importance of Islamic finance and economics in Muslim minority countries like Australia and uh, other lessons from uh, European countries. So thank you very much and. Uh, I also pay the thanks from our worthy Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Muhammad Tufail Tamgay Imtiaz. Uh, actually, our worthy Vice Chancellors were a little busy in uh, one of the uh, administrative uh, meetings. So, due to this, uh, he has not joined this session. So, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for sparing uh, your precious time. Uh, and giving us to make this uh, event happen and to make uh, uh, our audience able to understand regarding Islamic uh, economics, Islamic finance. So thank you very much for all the experts, for all the audience and participants. So we are grateful uh, for uh, attending this uh, events, international uh, symposium. 
thank you very much yes uh, i am also grateful for the focal person for uh, dr ahmed imran for organizing this special event uh, in ghazi university dera ghazi khan pakistan so meherbani sahi hai sir 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 sahi cha ke to sab baba ji sir thank you very much टॉक Thank you. Thank you. Assalamualaikum, everyone. Salam. Salam.